Tom uh, very much indeed for the opportunity to be here and actually to be here in the IIEA, which, as far as I can understand, has become a really important centre for discourse around public policy from a variety of perspectives and also doing so in a way that's quite happy to be challenging. Now, I feel quite challenged here today. Ban Ki-moon was in Ireland, as we've just heard. Amina Mohammed, my predecessor, was here. And then uh, David Donoghue, who has been such an important architect of the 2030 Agenda. And so the way I want to approach things today because it's my first opportunity to make a presentation, is to offer you some reflections about the 2030 Agenda, to talk to you a little bit about my own background and why I find this Agenda so exciting, but at the same time challenging. Then I want to reflect on you some of my understanding about the very special role that Ireland as a country and the Irish people have played in shaping this agenda and can play in ensuring its proper implementation. And I'd like to finish with seven points of hope and expectation that I have over the period in which this agenda is implemented, points that I'm going to use as a basis for my own internal assessment of progress. If you don't mind being used as a guinea pig in this, guinea pigs in this way, uh, it would also be very helpful if subsequently you could actually present me with your own views about the issues that I must give greatest attention to as I take on this role. So the most important starting point that I have is that 2015 was a triumphant year for multilateralism. You might say, how can we be triumphant about anything to do with 2015? It's been a year of, of actual misery on a very large scale in some parts of the world. So I think it bears repeating that actually 2015 what an important year in which leaders throughout the world reached some far-reaching agreements to which they are prepared to be held to account. In Sendai in Japan, early in the year, there was an agreement on the importance of disaster risk reduction as an underlying principle for development, which has led to a much greater appreciation of the importance of resilient communities and livelihoods as a basis for people's existence. Then, a few months later, there was the Addis Ababa Agenda for Action, an agreement on how the future of development would be financed and the role of development assistance. That's been put under pressure recently because of the challenges to development assistance budgets as a result of shortfalls in income and at the same time demands from dealing with migrants and refugees, but still the principles were agreed and are there for all to see. And then in September, after a long three-year negotiation process, the 2030 Agenda with its 17 goals, its 159 targets and numerous indicators was agreed and supported by the largest ever gathering of heads of state and government in the history of the United Nations. That was a key moment, uh, the 26th and 27th of September, uh, where, as Dimpner has just said, there was an agreement on the nature of the plan for the future on which all have committed. And that was followed, kind of unexpectedly for some, by an extremely successful outcome of the Convention of the Parties on 
climate COP21 in Paris, where an agreement for action to limit the rise in the Earth's temperature, certainly to two degrees and ideally to less, was reached. There are questions about whether the commitments made in country statements are going to add up to that degree of temperature increase and some concerns that it'll be hard to hold the countries who made their commitments to account, but certainly the COP21 agreement was much more potent than we thought it was going to be. Now that was a year of multilateralism, but it's now 2016 through to 2030, which is the timetable for the implementation of the agenda, it's now that we're all going to be put to the test. And what a test it's going to be. These goals that underpin the 2030 agenda are universal. They're not just goals for one set of countries or one set of communities. They apply to the whole world. These goals cut across the three strands of international effort and action, peace and security, human rights, and development. It's what my boss, the Secretary General, refers to as goals that go right across the Charter. These goals are indivisible. It's not acceptable, according to the nations who agreed these goals, that one or another can be removed from the rest and treated in isolation. It's no good saying we're going to pursue goal two or goal five and leave the others. They are to be accepted and treated as a totality, as a tapestry that basically has to underlie the totality of thinking and action for the future of the world and has to be weaved in to the DNA of national plans and also of their implementation. These goals have been agreed with the spirit of leaving no one behind and reaching those who are hardest to reach first. That's a big shift. That's putting equity right at the front of future global development policy. These goals, when you study them, are not just about people, they're also about the planet and its future. And they include within them a series of requirements, not just in relation to climate, but also to sustainable development, sustainable consumption, and sustainable use of land and water. These goals include a great deal of emphasis on people being at the center of action of accounting to people in ways that are related to fairness and justice and ensuring that the people who are the subject of development action are at the centre of efforts to assess the impact of what's being done. Well, we could argue that this is all just wishful thinking, this is leaders of nations coming together and agreeing something to which they're not prepared necessarily to be held to account. But a whole new accountability mechanism is being established. A high-level political forum is being created, will have its first meeting in the middle of this year. And at least as far as we understand it from within the United Nations system, there is an absolute willingness of leaders to be called to account on the implementation of this 2030 agenda. Why do I personally think this is so important? I started my life as a medical practitioner. I qualified in 1974, and I've been working in this field since then, initially in the British Health Service, and then as a medical practitioner in many locations, particularly in South Asia, in East Africa, and in the Middle East. And I, like so many others, many of you here in this room, realized early on 
that to work for health without working for the underlying conditions that generate illness or health is just missing the point. That we have to focus on the basic elements of people's existence, their assets to resources, their rights to have what they need for their existence, and their capacity to have redress in case they are exploited or in any way made to suffer by those who have more power than they do. A rights-based approach to development is the only means for development that has meaning for the majority of people who are poor in our world. Those of us who work in health, in education, in women's empowerment, in access to the rule of law, in water, sanitation, agriculture, or indeed in industrial development, recognize this as a basic truth of our work. And the great thing about this agenda for sustainable development, agreed last year, is it's essentially a rewriting of the human rights language that underpins those social and economic rights that have been agreed by the world for all. It's bringing rights into the center of development, and it's getting world leaders to acknowledge that rights have to be put up front and matter. In my subsequent years, as I've moved from working on health to working on nutrition and food, and then to being a coordinator in the United Nations for a variety of different issues, most recently on the Ebola outbreak, I have become more and more convinced that the basic truth of the importance of a rights-based approach to development has to be more and more enshrined in national policy, even in national law. And so I am very pleased indeed that this has become the basis of the agreement that has now come forth and is at the center of our program for implementation. I think we have many clues about implementation from the way in which Ireland <coughs> has approached development issues. Let me start from when I first got to know actually Tom Arnold and several others, when the Hunger Task Force was established and reporting in the period 2007 to 2008. It was a time when world food prices were rising at an astronomical rate, when the levels of food insecurity were increasing all over the world, and when governments were being imperiled because people were short of food. And what the people of Ireland and their institutions, their politicians and their organisations showed through the Hunger Task Force was that they were ready to share with others some of the lessons from their own history about ways in which hunger, politics and legal resource to, uh, resource to law are so closely associated. Tom Arnold once told me that we don't have shame about the past, but instead what we do want to do is to ensure that others understand our past so that perhaps they approach things differently from what happened in Ireland and in relations between Ireland and the UK during the very serious food situations that have occurred in this country. And so the Hunger Task Force became a present to the rest of the world from Ireland. It linked together health and nutrition, food systems, agriculture and social justice in a totally groundbreaking way. We drew on that hunger task force when the United Nations Secretary General set up a high level task force on food security in 2008. We not only benefited from Irish support, we also, in the person of Brendan Rogers, had a real champion in Irish aid who helped us to integrate within our framework for action on food security and nutrition many of the principles in the Hunger Task Force's report. We came together in 2010 in Malahide and what we did then was to integrate the right to food more strongly into all the United Nations future policies on food security and nutrition. And not only that, 
it developed a much more powerful gender and environmental dimension. Now, of course, it would be unthinkable to approach food security and nutrition without those dimensions. But at the time, this was groundbreaking. We have a huge debt to Brendan for the way in which he supported us so closely and intimately. And then, Michal Martin, your foreign minister in 2010, teamed up with Hillary Clinton to try to make certain that the nutrition dimension of food security got put center stage in global development, at a time when nutrition was still an orphan in development discourse. But it wasn't in the task force report. It was there, fair and center. And Michal Martin and Hillary Clinton brought us all together in New York during the General Assembly of 2010 and launched a movement for scaling up nutrition that would put countries at the center and get the rest of the international system to come in behind those countries and their people to ensure that nutrition, particularly nutrition between the beginning of pregnancy and a child's second birthday, was put in its proper place. Because we now know that good nutrition in those early years is key to subsequent mental and physical development of the individual. It wasn't just Minister Martin, but also right at the beginning, we had the involvement of Tom Arnold and of Mary Robinson in helping to shape this movement. And you wouldn't be surprised that it was as a result of their engagement that firstly the link between agriculture, food systems and nutrition got prioritized, but also, and this is really important, the concept of nutrition justice and the absolute need for the empowerment of women to be at the center of nutrition became mainstreamed. Again, now it seems bizarre that somebody need to make this point strongly, but that was Mary Robinson's contribution, and it stayed that way all the time since then that she's been involved in the movement for scaling up nutrition, which now involves 58 countries and represents one of the most extraordinary constellations of action to make a difference. And here I thank Tom Arnold, who's been coordinator of that movement since September 2014. Ireland has had a key role in the Global Agriculture and Food Security Programme, a new fund that's been created to support this integrated approach to agriculture, food security and nutrition. Ireland has also had a major res responsibility for getting agriculture more centrally into climate debates. There, I'd like to really compliment Minister Coveney and also now Commissioner Hogan, former minister of this country, and many officials in the Ministry of Agriculture of Ireland for having the courage to lay before all of us some of the trade-offs that have to be taken into account when we look at ways to ensure that agricultural practice mitigates against climate change and also to encourage adaptation of agriculture to take account of climate change. The water, the floods, the rain that is being experienced throughout this part of the world at this time is a sign of the work that's not just necessary here but necessary all over the world to help people's lives and livelihoods adapt to climate change. And in the field of agriculture, with dryness occurring in the Sahel, the Horn of Africa, and indeed in the North Africa, for example, in countries like Morocco, there is a great deal of work necessary now to get agriculture properly embedded into climate discussions. You don't need me to tell you that. You're doing it already. But what you can do now is to help the rest of the world ensure that between Paris COP21 and Marrakesh COP22, agriculture and food systems are properly integrated into climate discourse, that Mary Robinson's concept of climate justice gets mainstreamed, and also that communities are empowered to adapt their living systems and particularly their farming practices to climate change as quickly as possible. Millions of people are hurting, and unfortunately, most of the world doesn't know. Also in Ireland, you focused on the links between humanitarian response and development in a 
again, in a remarkable and unusual way. You have been behind thinking about getting food and nutrition security in protracted crises as a central issue. And as we move into the World Humanitarian Summit in May this year, you will be bringing to the table proposals for a much better understanding of the importance of protracted crises within the development agenda. And in that thinking, you are raising the uh, position of the concept of resilience, trying to make certain that development of societies and livelihoods so that they're resilient in the face of stress is right at the centre. And then President Higgins, in September last year, came to the UN General Assembly and said, this work on hunger and this work on food systems only has meaning if young people are involved. And he showed through his magical oratory and his ability to inspire everybody, whatever their age and wherever they come from, the absolute need to keep hunger at the centre of development and to work for a youth movement, what was called Generation Zero Hunger. I've got a few other examples, and I hope you won't get frustrated, but let me just take you to Sierra Leone, September, October, November last year, a country riven with the miseries associated with this terrible outbreak of disease that communities could not understand and thought had come perhaps from somewhere completely outside their consciousness and their experience. And we were working with the government of Sierra Leone to try to help the people get on top of it. Right at the centre was the community of Irish actors, non-governmental organisations, Irish aid and diplomats, who were saying, we've got to get this right. It's not just about government taking action to help people to cope with the threat of disease. It's about empowering communities so that they can change the way in which they do things so they're less likely to get sick and to suffer. And who was at the centre of that? An Irish diplomat, known to many of you, quite unprepossessing, at the same time very powerful. Passionate, yet at the same time capable of showing tough love when it needed. She's called Sinead Walsh, and she's somebody of whom if you're not, you should all know about her and you should be super, super proud of her because she led the diplomatic community in ensuring that the right approach was taken to get this a community-owned and focused activity in Sierra Leone. And Ireland is now right at the centre of rebuilding. It's Irish NGOs you find on the ground. I pick out one, but there were many. But I pick out Goal because it was Goal people that I met in Port Loco in Sierra Leone, who were showing just how you need to link what's happening in the treatment centre, which is a terrible place where death happens in large measure, and in communities, which are places full of excitement and life, and you have to bridge the gap between the two. Thank you, Goal, for that. Now, that's just a few vignettes, and there are many, many more examples. And my reason for saying this is that all of you have positions and interests in Ireland's international role. And in the field of development, sustainable development, universal sustainable development, Ireland has set the pace in a way that I believe has to be an example to all. So what are my hopes for the next 15 years? Well, firstly, holding this 2030 development agenda in place, maintaining the principles of universality and indivisibility really matters. But we mustn't present it as though somehow it's something new that's come in. It's got to build on what people are already doing. And there are many elements that I would like to see woven together, and I'd like your help with this. Firstly, what I said at the beginning, the 2030 Agenda is about the realisation of rights and the pursuit of social justice. I think this matters. And I think keeping the rights focus in there is super important. Secondly, empowerment or empowerment of women and gender equity in all policies and practices has to be there. 
And I would be delighted if as a result of this 15-year program, we really do have gender equity everywhere. Number three, incorporating resilience into all aspects of development everywhere, whether it's ensuring that people have access to adequate nutrition or that they are protected and are able to protect themselves against national disasters or health hazards like Ebola, resilience has to be at the centre of development work. Number four, integrating climate action into all aspects of development policy, whether it's adaptation or mitigation or both together. And fifth, ensuring that protracted crises and their impacts both on those who stay in crisis-affected areas and those who move and migrate, that this is at the centre of all development policy. Those are what I call the elements that I believe need to be woven together in a very explicit way into Agenda 2030. Second point, and now I speed up. It is time, I believe, to reinvent cooperation for development that builds on the important role of development assistance, and I'm not ever going to undermine that, but brings the whole of society into an involvement in development work, ensuring that young people in Ireland connect with young people across Europe, connect with young people across the world, to make sure that this agenda really is at the center of all thinking, and trying to build in the capabilities that are necessary for whole of society support for development action. Thirdly, new ways of working together. Gone are the times when it's just the government that did this kind of thing. Now it's networks, communities of practice, alliances, movements, some of them quite robust, some of them quite soft, <coughs> but safe spaces that are collectively owned where people can work together, in which activists are ready to be activate, to activated and to energize others. These new ways of working together are key to the future. Number four, ensuring that data and technology are made widely available, but in ways that are in service of people and society and not in any way extracted so that they're used for the benefit of a few at the expense of the majority. Number five, ensuring that when we are responding to crises with humanitarian action, it's needs-based. And that means renewing the commitment to humanitarian action, at the same time reviewing the contribution we all make and ensuring that at all times we're encouraging resilient, and self-sufficient community development. That is a tough one. It's all about capabilities of people and their societies, and that will have to be at the center of the World Humanitarian Summit in May and on. Number six, we will have to renew the international agencies of the United Nations system to make sure they're fit for this new purpose, as you were saying just now. And I think that it's partly about mandates, but it's mostly about manner of working, and a lot of it is about explaining ourselves. We're going to face a lot of shortfalls of resources in the international system in coming years because of the cutback in development assistance from many countries, particularly in Europe. We should see this as an opportunity and not as a threat. And number seven, my last point and my most important. Agenda 2030 is about how accounts are rendered. If development is being done, to whom should the accounts be given? Answer to the people for whom we're working. And that means that within development assistance and international cooperation for development, it's important that honesty, fairness, and justice are the underpinning principles of all our action. Do push us all on accountability, because I believe that that, in the end, is what really matters. It's just no good having good multilateral agreements in 2015, and then in 2030 looking at each other and say, well, that was very nice, but what have we really achieved? 
not sure we've done anything like what we said we would. Let's make it different. And I personally pledge on behalf of the United Nations system and our Secretary General to do all I can to try to make sure that we get it right and that the spirit that Ireland has given us shines through for the next 15 years. Thank you again.